Diplomacy, long believed to exist primarily for the purpose of effective government cooperation, is now a critical component of global business success. It's not enough to do well in the boardroom. Businesses must also do well in the communities in which they operate and must be perceived as doing well in the minds of their customers. In an increasingly interconnected world, public, private, and social sector leaders have to be able to communicate not only across agendas but across borders. As governments embrace the role of everyday citizens in enhancing international relations, agreeing on, public, on a public diplomacy agenda becomes increasingly important and challenging. I'm here now with Congressman Jim Moran of Virginia, we should say, uh, Bruce McNamer, the CEO of the J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation, and Carl Hoffman, the CEO of Population Services International. We're talking about the challenges of leading and connecting in a globally interconnected world. Congressman, over the years, you've seen the discourse between the public and private sectors. You've, I imagine you've seen it evolve. Mm -hmm. Can you, does it seem sometimes like they're, they're speaking a different language? And has it evolved? They're speaking a different language because their objectives uh, seem to be uh, disparate. But uh, the reality uh, is that um, there's nothing that they do that is mutually exclusive. In fact, ideally, they should be able to collaborate, and that would be to the best interests of both the public and private sector. Uh, clearly, corporations are benefited when you uh, have a healthier environment, when you have a better educated and healthier workforce, right. uh, when you uh, have more peaceful, stable, uh, conditions in, in foreign countries, uh, when you can have a consistent uh, a trade regimen that uh, where you know what the regulations and the rules and the laws are, uh, the uh, opportunities for collaboration are, uh, are uh, clear and apparent if you look for them. But uh, too often we politicize the differences between the public and private mission and, uh, and create tension where I, I don't think it ought to be there, and, and it tends to be destructive of the ultimate objectives of the public and private. On this question of investment in communities and developing markets and so on that we've been talking about, where do you see the tension between the private and public sectors? Well, uh, or I, historically uh, or now, yeah. Yeah, it, uh, you know, it's a mixed bag. I think we see uh, a, a lot of folk, particularly millennials, who want to do more than simply add to the bottom line, they, uh, and to look for the, toward the next quarter to maximize earnings. I think they want to be some, part of something that's greater than themselves, uh, and uh, and certainly that's that's possible. We're we're in such a more interconnected world, and we're finding that. Uh, in this borderless world where you can communicate with people on the other side of the planet within moments, really, you find that uh, there are ideas that hadn't occurred to you but that you can benefit from. Uh, we find, for example, with uh, the Arab Spring that there's a thirst for democracy and representation, and that came about through social media, and, and we're seeing a, a whole lot of people in government, particularly in emerging governments, recognizing that they need a, a capitalist system that's willing to invest in new ideas, that, doesn't, that isn't most interested in protecting the sinecures of government uh, and uh, protecting the, the, the uh, original economies, but are willing to be destructive to the extent it gives opportunities for new ideas and new companies. So the world is evolving. And, uh, and those that understand that, both in the public and private sector, are going to benefit mm -hmm. as a result. Uh, they, uh, we're finding that uh, if a private corporation doesn't uh, look for people who can speak many languages, who understand the histories and traditions and cultures of other countries, they're selling themselves short. Uh, we're finding that uh, more and more people want to work for companies uh, that um, are sensitive to the ecology of this small planet, and we're finding more and more uh, people who want to work for uh, uh, for companies that um, are interested in a well-educated, a healthy workforce, and and a, um, 
uh, the kind of sustainable policies that uh, give them pride to come home and know that they've made a better world for their families and the people they, they care about as a result of their uh, private sector career. So, Bruce, the congressman brings up a good point. Um, and you have a pretty, J.P. Morgan has a pretty vibrant philanthropic se sector. Um, you're involved in the skills initiative and the Global Cities uh, program. Uh, does that help you recruit great talent? Is that, is, is that how you view, you view it internally? I think that's evolving, uh, but certainly yes. I mean, as a corporate foundation, we have two goals. One is we want to make a difference in the world. Uh, and uh, we are doing that now um, by focusing on what we do philanthropically on economic growth. So to your point, new skills at work, our, wor our uh, workforce development program, small business development, financial capabilities, our global cities initiatives, all designed to sort of unleash the kind of economic potential in low and middle income populations, both in this country and internationally. And we do that, we've chosen those pretty specifically uh, because they can also help us bring, bring to the table in any of those undertakings the rest of the bank. Uh, these are things banks do. Our mm. clients care deeply about workforce development. We mm. bring a lot of small business expertise to the table, not just from a philanthropic view, but more from a banking perspective. So that motivates, I think, the kind of choices that we've made philanthropically. But the reason we do it is to make a difference and to engender the kind of pride in what we do and the standing in the community that goes with that. And more and more, I think, that sort of sense of I'm proud to be part of an organization that actually does care, that actually is involved in communities, that is invested in communities in ways that leverage the whole bank. And you know, that's not just a philanthropic Thing. That's about how do we bring the whole bank into the community. In, in many of the communities in which Chase and J.P. Morgan operate, it's not as if we're doing something to the community or, you know, what can we do with the We're in the community. Um, and uh, I think the kind of pride that goes with making a difference more and more is of great importance to millennials and others. I saw this in wearing my old hat at uh, running an NGO that worked in international development. There's, a, there's this generation um, cares deeply about a career that actually can be professionally rewarding in the classic sense of that word, but that also really uh, speaks to, and uh, in a very real way, their concerns about what kind of planet do we want to be living on? What do we hand down to our children? Uh, and this kind of satisfaction and the pride that goes with, actually, even in my day job, right. I can play a role in uh, making a difference. And for us, it's about, uh, certainly about how do you recruit the best and the brightest? How do you retain them? How do you give a sense of pride in being a part of this institution? And all of those are informed by what we're trying to do, both philanthropically and in communities more broadly. So you're relatively new to this job. I am, Describe yeah. the, the, um, the NGO you were with before. I ran an organization called TechnoServe, which worked on private sector development in the developing world. So in sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America, uh, and in India, really trying to help connect entrepreneurs, smallholder farmers, small businesses into viable commercial markets. And in that sense, we worked with the JP Morgans of the world. We worked with Coca-Cola. We worked with, actually we worked with IBM. We worked with the big coffee companies because a lot of the best coffee in the world comes from some of the poorest places mm -hmm. in the world. And so that notion that business was actually part of the solution to some of the most pressing social problems, some of the poorest place in the world isn't, was really nothing new to me. And I think part of the appeal of a place like J.P. Morgan is it brings such resources to bear beyond philanthropic in this global footprint, access to networks, the skills, the ability to allocate capital efficiently, the ability to think about problems, social problems included, in a way that kind of thinks about how do we do this efficiently? How do we get the right incentives in place uh, to make this sustainable? Um, so for me, the two, it's not, you know, one extreme to another. In fact, they're quite complementary. So going back to your sub-Saharan Africa experience, give me examples of what companies were doing right and what they were doing wrong. Yeah. I, I would say this about for a long time, and it kind of comes back to this theme of corporate diplomacy. Um, multinationals, private sector companies, been working in developing world for a very long time. And, uh, you know, the record on a social is mixed. But in many cases, they are responsible for driving real economic growth, creating jobs. Like I think what has changed, and I've seen it for the last 15, 20 years, um, is uh, it's no longer enough 
or uh, it's acknowledged only to be for corporations come and, and to say, we're investing in the country and that is enough. We're creating jobs. The opportunity is to be part of larger collaborations with NGOs, with governments, all at the same table in the context of private par public partnerships or the like to say, business can bring something to addressing this problem of poverty or these particular health challenges. Not the whole answer, part of the answer. Government, these are public goods we're talking about. Government brings something to that undertaking. Civil society and NGOs bring something to that. Uh, and the, in that context, there's a new role for business. It's a new kind of partnering arrangement. You're speaking, in some sense, a different language from the one you, that I think historically business has been uh, has spoke as they thought about developing markets in various parts of the world. Uh, and there, I think, this role of sort of corporate diplomat takes on a different kind of a, a hue. So, Carl, what were you able to take from your career as a diplomat to your role at PSI that's been most helpful in creating partnerships? And describe your diplomat for the audience, your diplomat <laughs> role before right. this. Yeah. So, uh, thanks, Nina. I've been at PSI, an NGO, uh, like Bruce was describing, we work in global health. Um, in about 60 countries around the world. I've been uh, privileged to lead that for the last seven years, but before that I worked at the State Department for 23 years, most of them in Africa. And I think all of us have touched on it in a different, each in a different way. I mean, the idea of uh, corporate diplomacy um, is not really new. And the idea that the private sector has been involved in political and economic and social development overseas, including in some of the most difficult parts of the world, is also not new. What's new and I think quite positive is that there's a very a constructive new lens through which this engagement is being viewed and the expectation that um, international private sector leaders have a, a role to play that's beyond simply delivering value to their shareholders. Uh, it has to do with um, creating wealth in the environments where they're operating. It has to do with benefiting the broader community. So I in my years in Africa, I, I saw some good examples of that and I saw some not so good examples of that. But I think the not so good examples are fewer and fewer these days. Um, Give us some not so good examples, even without names. I mean, you just, well, <laughs> just we're, we're here to learn. <laughs> Let's be honest. Um, corporations overseas, let's talk about American corporations, American-based corporations, um, have not always been associated in the past with the best successes. Neither has the American government. And I say that as a former American government employee. You know, um, we have um, strong traditions and strong objectives, but sometimes politics has gotten in the way of good outcomes, both for the private sector and the public sector, I would say. But what's different, I think, now is that shareholders and employees um, and all the stakeholders around the private sector are much less tolerant of that than they might have been in the past. Hmm. And that dissonance that sometimes occurs between the, the quarterly profit uh, report and a measurable social outcome is more often than it was in the past being resolved in favor of a longer term perspective. Uh, that's the optimist in me speaking. I'm not sure it's always true, but I think it's more true than it was in the past. So are, are corporate executives the kind of global diplomats of the 21st century? And is, is that potentially are there times they're going to be at cross-purpose with State Department diplomats? Or? Well, I think they always have been global diplomats, uh, maybe with a small d, but it would, no, no State Department Foreign Service officer ever thought that he or she had a monopoly on diplomacy. That happens through lots of different channels, including the corporate channel. Um, you think of examples today like uh, Paul Pullman at Unilever, who is leading a, a vast multinational enterprise, but also you know, playing a role at the UN on the uh, successor, successor goals to the Millennium Development Goals, is mm -hmm. very active within the World Economic Forum. I mean, he's operating on a stage that transcends, I think, his responsibility to shareholders. And that um, is a new and I think positive development. Your answer to that question? Or uh, yes. <laughs> uh, I do think, again, this role of corporate leader, not just opining about, but actually uh, marshalling corporate resources in cooperation with the UN or with the World Economic Forum or with USAID 
and really bringing the corporation into that kind of those broader arrangements is new, um, or at least in the last maybe 15 years. And it does kind of speak to two things. One, a sense that uh, on the part of shareholders, <laughs> that actually the agenda is a little broader right. uh, than it used to be. And two, I think a little less guardedness in civil society, in governments, politically and otherwise about you know, corporates, uh, you know, mm -hmm. corporates as being sort of the big and bad versus actually, if we're in this together and we have a shared agenda and we don't expect corporates to come in and just, you know, take responsibility for all of X problem and that the uh, concessions to be extracted from corporates are not so much in terms of license to operate, you pay us and you can come and work here, uh, but rather it's actually you bring something particular to helping to solve this social problem. And again, it's capital, it's skills, it's developing human capacity, it's efficiency, it's getting the right incentives. You know, if we can actually distribute this particular uh, drug or vaccine more efficiently by taking a lead from what corporates would do, that's actually a good thing. And I just think that is a new way of thinking about solving social problems. And yes, I mean, to Carl's point, business has been active in, in, in many of these countries for forever, and in some instances doing very bad things, and some instances doing very good things. Uh, but to be at the table and in leadership positions explicitly talking about poverty or health is a little different uh, role. So Congressman, it, I mean, I wonder if any of this makes you nervous. I mean, companies, private capital flows are into the developing world, as we know, are you know through the roof, um, whereas foreign aid is plateaued at a, at a pretty low level. Um, companies are doing, in my mind, some fabulous social engagement in these communities. Nevertheless, companies are self-interested, have a profit motive. They think they can align the two, and that, that's, I think, the, that's the mission, right? Do you think that's possible? Well, it depends on the corporate board whether that's the mission. Certainly it's possible. And we have some superb corporate leadership in the world, not just in the United States, uh, but in other countries as well. And Google, I think, is, is doing a terrific job in educating the world. Some of the telecommunication companies are enabling uh, countries to leapfrog over the old system of building telephone poles, and now they're, uh, they're, they're connected through uh, uh, by uh, the cellular phones. And, and um, even some of the natural resource countries uh, are showing the way. But then there are a lot of others. I mean, we just, the Senate just had a hearing on, on um, since we're naming names, Caterpillar, mm -hmm. uh, that goes to Switzerland so that they can pay four to six percent taxes. Uh, it's worth it to pay $55 million to figure out how to avoid paying U.S. taxes, and they save $2.4 billion. Well, that's not being a uh, global diplomat, uh, frankly, that's uh, exposing the worst of the system. And I don't know who they think is going to pay the revenue to enable the Defense Department to buy all that equipment from <laughs> Caterpillar if somebody's not paying the taxes. There, there, are some, you know, there, there are some CEOs who think their role is uh, a race to the bottom. Uh, the bottom being uh, the least regulation and the least taxation possible. It's not going to work that way, uh, if, but I, uh, I do find uh, some corporate executives that are willing to stand up to their board and to tell them, look, uh, you know, this may cost us something over the next quarter, uh, but over the next five years, this is going to be a sustainable growing corporation that people are going to want to invest in and who is going to have the credibility of the investment world. But, uh, you know, they're under enormous pressure. Uh, the, there was a survey recently, uh, and the, uh, the majority of uh, corporate CEOs said that they had to be more interested in uh, maximizing their, uh, their profit and loss over the next quarter than in making a decision that, while it might cost them in the short term, would yield substantial benefits in the long run. They're under that kind of pressure, and I, I think you have to look to the corporate boards of directors to uh, determined uh, whether the CEO is uh, able to be a good citizen of the world. Well, you also have companies that have outsourced to what are essentially dangerous sweatshops in other parts of the world, which Look is... Look at Bangladesh, absolutely. Yeah, um, and, you know, that, that's something to keep... Go ahead. I was just going to build on something that Congress was, was talking about there, that, the, you know, we, um, 
we've worked with corporations through their foundation arms. And uh, in the past, we would have talked, I think, about CSR, corporate social responsibility, as a way that NGOs, nonprofits, were getting resources from corporations to do good in some part of the world. I, I hopefully look for, and we're always trying to, to develop and, and um, bring to the fore a relationship that's not about CSR, it's more about P&L, somebody's profit and loss statement, because we think that's the most successful long-term way to, to, to drive real impact in the markets where we're working, trying to serve poor and vulnerable health consumers in those markets. And you call them consumers, which consumers, is important. Consumers, right. I mean, and because I think they de the deserve the dignity of being treated as a consumer. All right. of us want to feel that dignity, that we have choices to make. The, you know, the flow of resources that our tax code has enabled for corporations and others to, to make donations is a great thing. And many of us have benefited from that. But to really leverage the power of these huge institutions, corporations, to do good at massive scale, then somehow we, who are looking for measurable social return, have to try and figure out how to partner with them in a profit and loss sense. And this is hard. Uh, you know, it's easy to talk about. It's actually really hard to do. Mm -hmm. But I think that is what many of us in the social sector are trying to figure out now. And Give us we an have, example. I mean, is it is it you know is it incorporating women entrepreneurs in Indonesia running a kiosk into the you know Coca-Cola supply chain? I mean, what? Well, so for example, we were operating in a lot of those what would be in the in the bottom of the pyramid, base of the pyramid market places in the base of the pyramid countries, um, and. Uh, I think for a long time, those have been markets that weren't terribly interesting to big pharmaceutical companies or even to fast-moving consumer goods companies, let alone Caterpillar, the Caterpillars of the world. But their future growth, they realize, is increasingly in those markets. It's not in North America. It's not in Western Europe. That's part of the reason why I think corporate volunteerism and the sort of programs that are the context for our conversation today are so interesting to corporations because it's giving them access to an insight into those markets. And I think, you know, for us to be able to talk to them about how to develop those markets for them in ways that we can also measure the social impact around could be uh, differential pricing for pharmaceuticals that wouldn't be available to the bottom of the pyramid but might be if there's um, a greater engagement in that market and some differential pricing. So, you know, higher pricing at top, mm -hmm. uh, among people who can pay more for it, and subsidized pricing uh, uh, at the base of the pyramid, so to speak. That's a conversation I want to have with corporations because that is about their business logic. They, I think you're right, their employee base is interested in the good that the company can do. But ultimately, they're machines designed to create value mm -hmm. for shareholders and for consumers and for stakeholders. That's a very powerful machinery. So if we can figure out how to orient that in a way that is meeting social and economic needs at the bottom of the pyramid, I think that's a win for them and a win for the social sector as well. And, 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 and it's tricky. <laughs> and how so? I, well, because at the end of the day, the corporations are about profit and loss. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there'd better be profit. Uh, so how do you harness that whole set of incentives and all the efficiencies and skills and capital that can come with it to address social problems that sometimes don't have a P&L? You know, education, or except in the long short term. term. Not a short term, or it's a very at least long term. A lot in the short term. term. Yeah. And certainly that doesn't affect the P&L immediately of the company. Right. And so, but I th there is an evolving set of kind of models for saying, all right, we're trying to do two things. We're trying to address this public concern, this potential public good, and we're trying to get the power that business can bring to it. In that context, new arrangements that say, and some of the good will be profit and some will be public goods, and that say, and therefore will help business in this way, this way, or this way, in order to make it profitable enough for them. So a public-private partnering arrangement or an arrangement that might actually make the return that they would achieve by credit enhancements or loan guarantees or the like worth their profitable while. Because there is a public good to be served here. Those are the kinds of arrangements that you're seeing a lot more of. They're complicated. Pricing them is very difficult, but that's where I think the real opportunity is going to be in addressing some of these problems over the next 10, 15 years. Because you're so, right, foreign development assistance yeah. isn't going to do it. 
That's for sure. And, and it, uh, as has been said so well, it has to be part of the core culture, the competency of the corporation. They have to seize upon this. It's, it's, it's not as though uh, you can have one day of the year set aside for volunteerism right. or mm -hmm. uh, slice off a, a, a tiny piece of the profit and that's your pro bono or your foundation. That's like going to church on Sunday religiously and then figuring you can do whatever you want the rest of the week because you're good with God. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, no, it has to be an integral part of the way they operate, the way they make decisions. They have to explain that to the corporate board, and they have to have investors that are willing to look to the long term and, re and realize that they're part of, of something uh, important and that they can be proud of. And, but I, I do see changes being made. Um, you know, there's going to be a day when it's far less likely to three, see three middle-aged white guys in suits <laughs> talking about, uh, you know, global... I think uh, you're the first uh, panel of three white guys in suits, know. just so you know. Yeah, well, we're, we're just a little embarrassed about, you know, that they... But I think we're, we're going to recognize, particularly in the United States, with 4.5% of the world's population, that as you started out by saying, the real market is overseas. And if we're going to have a sustainable role in the development of those economies and the stability of those political systems, then we're going to have to invest. We're going to have to invest in management. We're going to have to invest in the, the, their natural resources, their environment, so they're more sustainable. And we're going to have to invest in developing goodwill among the people so that even when the, uh, the, the politics change, the people will want uh, to embrace and to hold on to that corporate presence. So in the long run, it's, it's going to pay off. We spoke earlier about China, um, obviously, is all over Africa, uh, investing in things but wanting resources in return, mm -hmm. not that American companies aren't also applying resources there. But, I mean, how do you see them doing things differently from Amer the way American yeah. and your Western companies are doing it? Well, a uh, really interesting uh, sort of developing story of China and Africa, and we don't actually know, I think, how it ends yet or where it goes. The engagement of China in Africa is huge and growing. Um, I, in my time there with the State Department, I saw over the course of my, almost, well, two decades really working in or on Africa, saw a marked change in the presence and the quality of Chinese diplomats and their ability to engage outside the walls of their embassy, they were quite impressive. Um, toward the end of my time in Africa, they were sort of you know, the, the, the folks to beat on the marketplace in terms of competing for ideas and influence. Interesting. It was, and, and they followed that up with a lot of state-sponsored capital and private sector Chinese engagement or state company engagement. I don't think it's yet clear whether or not that's really building lasting relationships. I think in many cases still a lot of Chinese companies actually bring labor to Africa, right. which is shocking when you think right. about it. And there's got to be some, you know, there, there, is, a, there is a lamentable um, pass that I think, um, I can say this because I don't work for the U.S. government anymore, but you know, the, the Chinese engagement in Africa has meant working with the authorities in place and turning a blind eye to any practices on the part of the regime that might be in place in a country and just worrying about creating a business relationship that was satisfactory to China. And to the US credit, I don't think we tolerate that any longer and shouldn't. And I think fundamentally that's the, the real, if you had to put your finger on one obstacle to development in, in Sub-Saharan Africa and other poorer parts of the world, it's a, it's a leadership problem, it's a governance problem, it's not a f money problem, mm -hmm. fundamentally. And I think to the extent that we allow those bad practices to persist, we just allow underdevelopment to persist. Right. So I think the Chinese are yeah. not helping in that regard. As, as self-critical as we want to be, uh, we are more appreciated than other countries like China today. Uh, we tend to learn the language, want to learn the culture, want to make longer term investments. I'm proud of that. But I have to say, I know we have to wrap this up. Right now, the State Department is spending more money on building taller, more impenetrable walls around our embassy than we are on diplomacy. 
And when we do that, what it means is that we've got to uh, look to the corporate sector, the, the, the business mm -hmm. community, uh, to play more of a role in terms of diplomacy with other countries and to reach out and to do a lot of the diplomacy that I know most uh, foreign service people would love to be doing if we weren't holding them back with so much obsessiveness about uh, their security. Excellent point. Bruce, you have 30 seconds if you want a final point. Well, the only thing I'd add uh, on China is we've made great progress uh, globally uh, against the Millennium Development Goals. Part of that was China's own success in lifting about 450 million people yeah. out of poverty. That's interesting. And that's that was driven point. by a new approach yeah. to business and unleashing the power of business in these countries. And that's ultimately, I think, a hope for many of the countries we've been talking about. Excellent. That's a good point. Yeah. Thank you all so much. This has been fabulous. It's been nice Thank you. Good luck.